Well, hello and welcome to the first edition of The Raw Corner. My name is Simon Smell and over the coming weeks, we'll be whetting your footballing appetite with stories from some of the club's favourite sons, beginning with the one and only Eric Partaloo. Eric, thanks very much for joining me. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you, a genuine legend of Brisbane Raw. Um, <laughs> As sure as everybody is aware, um, Eric went down in club folklore with probably the greatest moment in any home day league grand final, not just in terms of Brisbane Raw football. Um, but that was only one of 79 games that you played for the Raw and scored eight goals as well. Got pretty handy three championships. So, uh, yeah, welcome. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure. And um, it's, it, it's great to talk to somebody with such a vast and varied footballing experience as well, because for, we'll start from, I guess, the present day. You're currently playing in India at the moment, which is probably not the most sort of your, your typical footballing destination, but it's an area and it's a country that I think draws fascination from everybody. Um, so you've just re-signed with uh, Bengaluru FC in yep. the Super League. So you've been there since 2017. How, how did that all come about? Yeah, look, mate, uh, football's taken me to some uh, some weird and wonderful places, and I have to credit that uh, pretty much from my time at Brisbane Raw. I was there for two and a half seasons, and, um, yeah, I think uh, I had the opportunity to leave a lot earlier from Brisbane, um, but decided to stick around and, and win the second uh, championship, which has kind of led me on this path where I'm at now, and... Um, you know, with a short, brief top over in Australia playing for Melbourne City. It's been mostly in Asia. And, uh, yeah, find myself in India. I've been there three years. Um, I just signed a new two-year deal with, with Bengaluru. Um, it's just an amazing place. Uh, it's a completely different place. It's not the easiest place to, to live, um, but it's just been a, a really rewarding experience on and off the pitch. Great bunch of boys, a great club. Um, you know, a, a club that has won things and has won things whilst I've been there as well, which always makes it easier. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to continue the journey and um, keep playing at a professional level as long as I can. Well, it was two premierships in a row with Bengaluru, is that right? When, when you yeah, well, <laughs> we, we actually won the league the first year I was there um, and we, we lost the, the grand final. And then the year after, uh, we did the double. Um, and sorry, in the first year, we won the, the Super Cup, which was basically a, a cup version, uh, like you guys do the FFA Cup. So we won, yeah, so we basically won two trophies in the two years whilst I was there. Uh, we didn't win anything last year, which was probably in the club's history the first time they haven't won a trophy in a year. Uh, they, 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 they boast the, um, the record of having six in six. Um, and that was when they used to play in the old competition in the I League. They'd won a couple of titles there and a Federation Cup, which was another version of the Cup. Obviously, it's still very, very raw and very new, uh, the, the format in India, and it's, it's ever-changing, mate. And, um, yeah, this year, we didn't win anything. We finished third and lost to uh, uh, ATK, which is uh, David Williams and Roy Krishna's team in the, in the semi-final uh, wow. over two legs, and they went on to win it. And um, that's the first season we haven't won anything. So it was a bit of a, a shock. Not a shock, but it was more of a... Uh, kind of a wake-up call that the, the league is improving and getting better. And, um, yeah, certainly the level's going up and up every year. Well, when you see players like um, Krishna and Williams heading over there um, or forgoing A-league contracts, I guess that, that does show that there is a, a rise in Indian football. You've commented before, though, that it's a relatively short season uh, and that yep. is a frustration, uh, I can imagine. Yep. What is it, 18 games, 18 league games? People take a couple yeah. of finals matches? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult at the moment because uh, the leagues were kind of uh, overlapping each other and you've got a very similar scenario to the NSL A-League, uh, you know, scenario, I guess, that um, the I-League is the oldest uh, league that they have uh, and there's been a breakaway competition. Um, and at the start, five, six years ago, the boys were able to play in both because the seasons were so short. And the ISL, the Indian Super League, the league I played in, uh, was generally uh, a league for, you know, the Indian boys, the top Indian boys, and a lot of retired foreigners. I mean, you saw guys like, uh, you know, Nicholas Anelka, Roberto Carlos, guys who've been finished for years. Del Piero's played there. Uh, and they came, yeah, I mean, they came across for like, you know, three months and 
pick up a bit of money and, and get out of there. But now the season's in its, uh, is it the seventh or the eighth season? It could be the seventh, I think. Um, and I think it is more professional now than it ever has been. There's a lot of, uh, you know, changes to infrastructure. There's a lot of changes to uh, the staff. It's just, you know, the, the, the level of foreigners now are becoming, you know, your mid-level foreigners, if I'm not being disrespectful, like we're not, guys that have finished our playing careers you're getting guys in their early 20s to early 30s playing you know the best parts of their career in India and obviously um, you know it's more attractive for a, uh, even these guys in Spain there's a lot of Spanish guys instead of playing in the second league in Spain they're playing in India because they can earn more money um, but it's just the uh, it's a general feel that the game's growing over there and it's always good to be a part of you know a growing league very much like the A-League, when I kind of joined, it only been around for a couple of years. Uh, it's had its up and downs. But, um, yeah, I feel like Indian football is growing. But to go back to your point, uh, it was meant to go to 27 games this year, playing each other three times. But it looks as though with the virus, uh, they've now tried to talk to the AFC and basically put it back to 18 games because of the, the Women's World Cup, the under-17s is there in Feb. And obviously with the IPL, the cricket, um, there's a few things that they have to be moving in about. So I think, I think they're going to stay at 18 games for the next season, which is a bit of, uh, a, bit of a frustration, yeah. So I was told by um, Jason Dace, who does a bit of commentary um, across Asia in terms of football and a variety of sports, that the Super League is the IPL of Indian football. So I guess, I guess that's yeah. kind of how you explained it with the foreign mm-hmm. stars coming in. But there must be a rising level of Indian players and talented Indian players I I guess I've got a couple of questions about that like have you like you mentioned it already you've noticed that the standard is Mm -hmm. is increasing and is that based on a lot of young players domestic players coming through and the other thing if it is the IPL of Indian football does it have all the razzmatazz does it have the big crowds does it have the fireworks the cheerleaders is it is it a real show as well it's, it's probably more of a show than a game, but I think it's fizz, it's definitely fizzled out, since, not since I've been there. Um, I think that the way that I've seen the way the, the game has progressed is just in the terms of the, the quality of the league. When I joined three years ago um, in my first season and the club's first season in the ISL, uh, we were so far ahead of everybody else. Um, we were lucky enough to have the AFC Cup, which is a completely another subject, but it, it sort of boosted us to come back early. You know, you're training three or four months, playing all these games in Asia, and then starting your season off the back of having, you know, three or four months on some teams. So you were, you know, you get into Christmas time playing 10 or 11 games going undefeated, and you've got 18 games. If, if you're that far in front, no one's going to catch you, and it's only top four out of the 10. So what I have noticed is, the first season, I would say there was one, two, and three teams that you were worried about. The rest, you knew, if we do our job, we're going to win this game. Um, like the year before last, it became, ooh, there's a difficult, it's difficult to stay in the four. And then this year, it's been, it's been even harder where you've got at least six or seven teams that should be in, in that four position. Um, and I think the club, from our point of view, didn't invest well enough in, in, the, in a foreign striker. And that's no disrespect to, to the boys that we had. We just had a very, very good one. Um, and they paid a lot of money for him. Um, and they just decided to not uh, renew the budget for the year. And, uh, you know, you, you sort of pay for what you get. If you can have a guy that's, you know, banging in all the goals and making the difference, it was a lot easier for us. Whereas this year, we had to be quite defensive, had a few injuries. Um, and we also didn't have the AFC Cup campaign at the start, which usually gave us this this vital edge, you know, three or four months together before all the teams had started. So it's it's becoming completely, um, you know, a league where I think even next season we will be eight eight or nine teams that are that are decent, and you know maybe one team that's not because it doesn't want to pay the money. Um, but I think the league is growing from that point of view. Uh, in terms of the players. Um, you've got guys that I work with in, in the in the team in Bengaluru. You've got, uh, you know, five or six national team players. Um, and these are guys who are getting draws against Qatar. They're not, they're not uh, you know, they're not the India of old, if you like. They've, you know, they've improved dramatically. You've got a guy, Sunil Chetri, who's the, the captain of India and the captain of our team. 
I think he's uh, he's sandwiched in between Messi and Ronaldo for international goals, like currently. Um, and he's just an amazing uh, inspiration to, to a lot of kids over there. And obviously, to play alongside him, you have uh, a very Matt Mackay feel where you have uh, someone who's, who's driving the team on a daily basis and um, is, is very well regarded over there. He's very close with Virat Kohli, the Indian uh, cricket captain. Um, so his level of, of fame over there is is ridiculous, but the way he goes about it, he still pushes himself in his mid thirties, um, and he is the you know is the highest goal scorer of an Indian probably every single year of the, of the league. Um, you know guys like him. You've got Guprit Singh Sandhu, which is the number one goalkeeper of India. He's six foot six, um, one of the best goalkeepers I've ever worked with. He went overseas. Um, he was playing in, I think, Norway and played in the in the Europa League. Um, he had some experience and came back when the ISL became a good enough league. He's not being tested at all. He's too good to be here. Um, and you kind of get that feel now with a lot of these youngsters, especially uh, the ISL won't be won't be good enough to to, to harbour their talents, and then they need that pathway to use the Asian passport and come to places like Australia. Who will have them? Or go to Thailand or you know, try to get to Europe. But, um, you know, from, from when I arrived to now, there's a lot of younger players uh, that are Indian that are getting chances because they're good enough. Um, and they have a lot of academies over there. They have uh, the Tata Academy, which is a, a Jamshedpur team that's basically funded by the, the biggest steel company uh, and car company in, in India. And a lot of the good players come from that academy. Uh, Bengaluru has their own academy that they start from a very young age and they're away in a beautiful complex that have great facilities and they're starting to get good coaching. Um, you can see the level around Indian football growing and growing, but it's it's never going to take over cricket. But um, the interest is there. You can see kids in the street kicking a ball now rather than playing cricket. So it's uh, it's changing for sure. And is that matched in the crowds that you're getting in these in, in the stadiums as well? Like. So that, that's something that I have noticed has dwindled. Uh, I, I won't lie about that. The first season, um, and that's for two things, the, the two biggest clubs weren't doing well. So Col- Kolkata and Kerala Blasters, um, they both have, you know, between 60 and 80,000 seater stadiums. And when I first arrived, you were getting in front of these crowds that were just mind blowing. Um, just, you know, you can't hear yourself speak and they're just at it. Um, they've been performing quite poorly, although Kolkata won it last year. For the, the two years before, they were quite poor and invested heavily. So the fans sort of gave up and, and stayed away. And the same with Kerala. Um, but in terms of like our local crowd, I mean, we get between fifteen and 25,000 every game. And it's uh, a very vocal, um, I wouldn't say hostile, but they, they, they tend to get us across the line in a lot of games when we're, we're, lead, we're, we're coming from behind or drawing. Um, but the crowds across the board have definitely gone down. And I don't know if that's just something to do with uh, the bigger teams not performing and the little ones, you know, performing better. But, uh, you know, we're never going to compete with the, 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 the cricket. And that's why we don't. We just don't schedule when the IPL is on. Um, but, yeah, it, it is getting better. But I felt like now there's, a, there's an opportunity to try and, and lift that profile again. Maybe some signings, you know, some high profile signings might help people come to the games. So, I mean, you spoke a little bit there about uh, pathways and about players perhaps getting a chance to go around Asia and even heading to Europe. That's something that you did, uh, obviously, pretty early on. So you went to Scotland yep. after playing a little bit in the little bit locally here in Australia. Um, yep. What was that like, upending your upending your your life, I guess, to, in in hmm. pursuit of, in pursuit of a professional career and a professional contract? Yeah, it's it's something I don't. Uh, look back on and it, it's 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 really hard to talk about because um, it was like one day just well obviously I trialed a couple of times in in Europe before I'd I'd got the chance to sign a contract in Scotland but I knew when I called my parents from Scotland and I was you know signing my first professional contract that it would just I didn't even celebrate it it was just like I've got training tomorrow I'll call you after my first game and then it's been like that since you know I was 19 or 20 years old, where it's just the next game, the next week, the next you know. Um, it hasn't really slowed down until now with India, because India have you know four or five months where you're not playing. Um, so you try not to reflect, but you're right. I think a lot of these players they get exposed. Um, 
to, to a, a higher level uh, when they're younger is, is vital. I mean, you look at boys like Aaron Moy, everyone thinks, oh, he had a, an average year at Western Sydney and then he just blew out in Melbourne City. No, he didn't do that. He, he was over in, in the UK when he was 15 years old, you know, doing school, not doing school, straight into football. And, uh, yeah, it, I just found, like, with, with people like Aaron, um, that there's a pathway that, that, that players these days probably have to take and it's not going to be a comfortable one. So for me, uh, it was the end of the NSL. I was starting to get a little bit of a sniff in the NSL, um, probably more of a squad player, if I'm honest, at 17. But uh, it forced me to go overseas and, and, and try and make it in, in, in Europe. And uh, luckily for me, um, you know, I think I played for four years in Scotland, um, but that wasn't before I went through a lot of adversity with injuries and, you know, three times, you know, getting sent over there and not making it and coming back with my tail between my legs and, you know, wanting to give up. Um, there was a lot of times like that. But like I said, once I got into that, that mindset of signing my first contract, I, I think I scored on my professional debut in, uh, in Scotland and the, and the rest was history. So I was very lucky. And um, I think if I would have just stayed in the, in the A-League or the NSL at that stage, I don't know if I would have been pushed uh, or even pushed myself to have gone to that level. So um, I, I have to look back and be thankful for everything I've had. So those four years, it was Parramatta Eagles um, before you headed to Scotland and then it was Gretna yep. Sterling and then um, Grenach Morton. Um, yep. But then you came back to Brisbane um, and I guess the rest is is a history that a lot of people here will be very familiar with. Was it always in your, in your mind to perhaps come back to Australia and come back to Brisbane? Because you were one of Andrew's yep. first, first signings um, at the Raw. So, yeah. Uh, it was a really strange one because uh, I, I'd kind of got to the end of any sort of progression in Scotland. I started like a house on fire my first season, uh, played almost every minute in the first division. Then we got promoted to the Scottish Premier League. And at 2021, 20, I was expecting to walk into the team every week. And, uh, you know, they'd sign a guy from the championship who had been playing and he was mid thirties retiring but he had experience, so he was playing in front of me. So I was really frustrated at the time. And, uh, you know, I let, I let everybody know about it. And, and they asked me to go on loan. And at the time, I was like, I don't, I'm not going to go on loan. Like, what, what would I go on loan for? And then eventually, I wasn't getting enough games and ended up going on loan. Um, and then that club went into, it, it, into administration. And um, it led me to Greenwich Morton, where I had a great two years, um, sort of up and down. Um, but around about Christmas time before my deal expired, I had six months left. Um, my agent at the time, uh, David O'Keefe, uh, you know, had a decent relationship with Ange and he, he heard about what he was building in Brisbane. And he, he sort of called me and said, I think it's, uh, you know, you should consider coming home. There might be an opportunity for you. And I said, absolutely. I'm kind of done with this. I want to come home if there's an opportunity. And, uh, it was funny because Ange, <clears throat> I had him in the Joeys and he wasn't, and you know what he's like, he's not very personable. So I didn't know if he liked me. I kind of thought when I finished with the Joeys, we'd, we'd lost uh, every game in the World Cup and we got sent home and it was just kind of a bad ending. And I thought, that's, I'm never going to play for Australia again. And, um, you know, to hear through through my agent that he was interested, I was I was all ears because I was like, this guy, he, I, I just knew what sort of path he'd gone on. You know, he'd gone overseas and, and, and into Greece and things. And, he, and I'd read up on him and, you know, whatever. And uh, when they started talking about signing a three-year contract, I was like, let's, let's do this. Let's commit. Let's go. Um, I saw that Brisbane were at the bottom of the league. And I was like, okay, what's happening here? What am I getting myself into? Um, and then... I sort of played the, le the last sort of six months of my deal in, in Scotland, knowing that I had this uh, new contract and I was up front with my club and everything. And, um, and then I felt like, uh, particularly being in Scotland, I learned how to play the game. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't technical. It wasn't positioning. It wasn't uh, shape. It was just get stuck in, win your second ball and put it in the channel. And I had all this upbringing as a footballer in Australia, how to make angles and how to take a good first touch. Um, Scotland really made me a man and it, it taught me some harsh lessons. 
but it wasn't until I came back to Brisbane that I really fell into the groove of being the footballer I knew I could be. Um, and I'm, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed when I go back to Scotland because I don't feel I was anywhere near a level. Uh, I, I felt very uh, confused on the football pitch. I didn't know my role. Whereas when I came to Brisbane, it was so clear, so defined. Um, and we all knew each other so well. We trained so well together. So when I came to Brisbane, everything sort of changed for me in a football sense. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very thankful for, for Ange for, for getting me back. <laughs> and how much of that was down to down to Ange, like just in terms of setting up that environment? Um, you know, the fans yeah. know it as Raw Salona. I know when I first moved yeah. to Brisbane, I was told, ah, oh, you're lucky, you're a football fan, you're going to enjoy watching the local team because they play good football. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I yeah. mean, that was bringing out in what I, what I saw. Um, it must have, did you all just click instantly? Like, is, is that pretty much just how it worked or? It was so strange for me because I, I turned up and they, you know, you know how long the pre-seasons are in, in Australia at that point in time. It was like a five-month pre-season or something ridiculous. <laughs> so, I, so I turned up in uh, just like straight away after my season had finished. So I couldn't wait to get up to Brisbane from Scotland and uh, met with Ange, met with the boys. Um, and I remember speaking with, with Shane Stefanudo. And as soon as I spoke to him, I just felt so comfortable i didn't even know shane i just knew of him i knew he'd played you know in the national team i knew he was coming off an acl injury still recovering um it just seemed like a real place that i could grow you know you come from a a, a uk environment where you're you know you, you're slated all the time and you've you, you've got to take banter and you've got to um not take things too seriously because everyone's always joking and, and and taking the mick all the time whereas you come to australia everyone's like you know, wanting to get better. And I think Ange, he knew what type of team he was constructing. It was all boys that had a, a point to prove. You know, you had Theo coming back from from a, a shocking time in, in the UK and copping seven goals and not playing again and um, had a point to prove after leaving Australia coming back. You know, Shano had his ACL. Matty Smith had a point to prove just starting his, his career late. Thomas Broish was a kind of an ingredient that was like... Uh, come and help us out and enjoy your football. Matty Mackay had been there for so long and not had any success. Um, Massimo Madoka was another one that just hard working, but lacked direction. I, I, could, I could go on throughout the whole team. I missed everybody out, but um, he, he had the, the key ingredients for, for what the team needed at that point, which was, are these boys going to listen to me? Can I mould them? Um, and are they going to prove a point and be hungry? And I think every single one of us, uh, when we got together on a daily basis, we had great coaches around us. You know, we had obviously with Ange, Rado and, and Kenny Stead. Um, but, you know, Ange drove absolutely everything. His, his philosophy on the way to play football, um, it was no coincidence. We worked so damn hard for, you know, four or five months to get that way of playing. And we still didn't work it out for the first couple of weeks. We were still unsure of playing out from the back and going we're going to cop a goal soon like what we can't ask Theo to play the ball to your midfielder with someone on your back like but he made you believe and we did it enough in training that we believed in the process um and that's why he's such a good coach he just makes you believe in in things that other coaches don't all right well let's it's obviously a team that had such incredible success but let's talk about that grand final in 2011. Um, we've all yeah. seen the footage. I think most Raw fans sit watching that on repeat. Whenever they're having a bit of a down moment, they just realise that that was one of... Oh, as a supporter, as someone who's not played the game at a, at a top level or really any sort of level, it's, it, 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 we can't understand how that must feel. Um, it, it, we, we don't understand how, how it must feel to be part of a team that comes back from the dead mm. and, 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 to, and, to, and to, to be the person who scores that goal. From your perspective, what sounds like a silly question. It's probably a hard one to answer, but what's it like? <laughs> what, yeah, you're right. It it, like? It, 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 yeah, it's so, it's so hard to answer. Um, I guess it was life-changing, career-defining, life-defining. Um, it's very difficult to deal with it afterwards because after all the hype had died down um, and across that off season, I, 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 I had to make peace that I was never going to be able to repeat that or have that feeling again. 
I was so thankful to have had it um, and to still live through it now. Um, I, I knew from that point on that nothing would ever come close to that. And it was almost like, not that we deserved that, that success because football and sports never liked that, but we were just so dominant that whole season. Um, and we, we didn't give a great account of ourselves in that grand final. We, we, I think the Mariners had a really good game. Um, but I just remember just, yeah, being in that moment and just being totally motivated to be uh, just the way we always are at Brisbane, just to never give up. And, you know, if there's five seconds or five minutes on the clock, there's still time. Um, did did I, you all I, still I, believe all the way yeah, through? Yeah, absolutely. Like, like, it was ridiculous. Like, any other team nowadays or even any team that I've been in, I, you don't give up. But you see the 90 minutes come up and you go, I'm a goal down. No, there's no chance we're not going to get one here because other teams will slow it down or you don't get a chance. It was just even the way we, we, we scored that goal, you know how it is. Everyone's gone through it. You know, Theo ro rolls the ball out and we play it forward. I mean, we're playing five, six, seven metre passes and then getting that corner. Um, I just remember Thomas going over quickly to take it. And I, obviously I was playing at the back the last sort of 10, 15 minutes. Ange had put me at the back and um, I don't think anyone was set for the corner from, from, from the Mariners. And I kind of came from a deep position and no one picked me up. And usually as a big guy, as soon as you make contact with me, I've got, oh, I've, I've got to try and get away from you. I've got to try and, you know, find a, find a spot. Um, I just felt like as soon as I started making my run in the 18-yard box, everyone was fixated on the ball. And I was just like, if that ball is good, I'm, uh, there's no way I'm not scoring this. And the ball was absolutely perfect from Thomas, of course. And um, mm -hmm. I just remember making good contact with it and just making sure to keep it down. And... Um, yeah, the rest is a bit of a blur. You just kind of go out of your body and you run off to the corner flag. And um, it's exhilarating, but it was exhausting. You couldn't get your breath. Um, you just, you felt so alive. You felt so important. Um, and it's just like more than any other goal that you'll ever score in your career. And uh, running back to the halfway line, I was expecting the game to restart. I was like, come on, let's play again. And um, that was kind of the mentality we all had at Brisbane Raw was that... Uh, you know, we'd never give up and we'd just play until we win the game. Um, and that was just a yeah, special, special moment. Yeah, I think every Raw fan in history knows about it. Every Raw fan still talks about it. I think everyone that I mentioned that I was talking to you said to me, oh, you could see a bit of a glassy eye sort of came across them, a little bit of reminiscing. Mm -hmm. Um, do, do you it's still nice. get that? Like, I mean, I'm smiling while you're talking about it. I, I can you yeah. know, feel those memories coming back. Like, is that, is that what you remember as well? I, I don't try and carry it with me because it's, it's, uh, it's something that's it's, it's hard, not, not hard to get over. I'm so blessed that it happened to me. But I think if you sit here and reminisce too much, you lose focus of what's in front of you. And um, it's, it's never going to be topped in my career. Um, but basically, for me, I'm still playing and I've got to remember that and there's still moments to be created and I still have goals and I'm still hungry for success. And, um, you know, I, I don't tend to take it with me or reminisce or, or walk around and feel, you know, oh, important or, yeah, I remember that goal I once scored. Um, I know it's what people are going to label me when I finish my career, but, uh, but for now I'm still kind of fighting to, to, to keep playing. And um, I think when I finish playing, I'll have more time to reflect. And, um, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a very special moment for my family as well because they're all up there watching and, um, yeah, the smiles on their faces. And I jumped into the crowd after the game. They just couldn't believe it. And, uh, um, yeah, just a beautiful moment that I'm really blessed to have. And uh, that's why we play the, the beautiful game is for, for times and moments like that where you think you're down and out and, and somehow someone throws you a lifeline and, and um, you end up on the, on the winning side. So it was, it was a, pretty awesome. And you have to enjoy those moments, right? Because like you said, you know, they, they, don't, come around, they don't come around every year. No, uh, the boys will, uh, will tell you that that week in Brisbane was pretty heavy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, you don't, the, the best advice Ange ever gave was after the grand final, we, 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 we gathered in the centre circle after both times that we won, actually, and uh, when I was with Ange, and he just said, uh, like, he, he goes, enjoy tonight, 
but remember it. Don't go and get yourself, you know, crazy drunk and forget this moment because you've worked so hard to get it. And uh, just enjoy the feeling of being around your friends and your family. It's what it's all about. And that first night was was a very big reflective night. I mean, we stayed out all night, but it was more, uh, you know, talking and hugging people and hugging fans. And we were, you know, down Caxton Street. We were, we were everywhere on, on that on that uh, Sunday. And then the whole week was was such a nice week to be with everybody. Um, you know, we went out for lunches, for dinners together. You know, we went out drinking and carrying on. And and by the Friday, I think we kind of settled it down. Um, but as we are at Brisbane Raw, once we'd, we'd, we'd finished that week, it was kind of like go off and have your off season for five or six weeks. And the moment we came back, it was never a thought in my mind that um, was still there. I'd, I'd forgotten about it and moved on. And um, it's hard to say that because it's such a special moment, but it's what I had to do to, to try and keep going. And that's why the Raw were so successful, of course, over those over that period. It was a case of, right, yeah. that's done, put it in the locker and move on yeah. to the next one. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned Thomas, um, his delivery um, f- for that goal. Um, you were pretty instrumental in his recruitment, weren't you? Is, is, that, is that right? Me? No, it wasn't me. I don't know who, I don't know who that story has come from. I think, uh, I think Ange obviously had that story, went and, went and had coffee with him, but I'm pretty sure... Was it Dario or was it Bessar? Some I don't know. Maybe somebody had known about Thomas. I think maybe Dario had played with uh, with Thomas. I'm not sure how that came about, but I know obviously the story is Ange. You know, travelled five six hours to have a coffee with Thomas, and um, we were so lucky to get him across because he was the the X factor for us. And, and playing with someone like Thomas as well, like you know, playing alongside Thomas, having that as a you know midfield fulcrum, and you. Mm. playing forward to him. I mean, it was just, it just must have made such a huge, it, it was just such a huge part of that team. Like, you need that solid core, right? In any successful yeah. championship winning team? Yeah, you do. Uh, I think a lot of it, even when you see, if I can relate it to where I'm at now in India, a lot of the strength is the foreigners through the spine, through the middle. Um, and that's kind of where, most teams have their strength, but you've got to have these, you know, these creative players out wide or in a further position up forward to number 10. Thomas was just on a different level to anyone I've played with in my career. Um, I keep having a, an image on my head about the, I, I had, I got the goal of the year. I think it was that season. And if you watch the replay on that one, the ball goes to Thomas and he's facing towards the corner flag and somehow 180s himself in one movement to kick the ball on the edge of the box and I hit this volley in the top corner but it was I don't think he even knew I was coming but he must have sensed somebody would be there and um, there's not very often in that in that raw system I was allowed to get forward I had to sit off quite a lot and dictate play and play forward into, into people's feet um, and this one time I just sort of charged forward and he, and he must have just felt me coming and you know, everyone talks about how he used to, you know, do his shimmy and how nobody could get close to him. Um, he was a special, special talent, but his awareness of what was around him, um, how to play a pass, the weight of the pass. I mean, his assist for Enrique's first goal, no one in the league would even thought of to, to have swiveled and laid it off for, for Enrique to score. And um, he's just a special, special talent. I don't think the A-League's seen anyone like him. Do you... As a player, do you ever start taking that for granted a little bit that you know that he's going to play those passes? That you, just, you know, you, you start making runs thinking, you know, that you've in other clubs perhaps that you played in in your career, you knew there's no point in making that run because the ball's not going to be able to get to you. But when Thomas was yeah. on the ball, did, did you just start to take that for granted almost? Um, we, we saw what he could, he was capable of at training and. His, his work rate was so high as well. He wasn't one of those guys that's a creative player and he's lazy in defence. You know, Thomas would be, you know, understanding and, and, and have to fill in and do his job uh, defensively. And the coach didn't treat him any differently. If he, if he didn't do his job, he'd, 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 get, he'd get barked at, you know. Um, but with, with Thomas, because he, he's playing in front of me, if I ever played a pass into his feet or anybody else had played a, a pass into his feet, it was very rare for him to come backwards unless he was tired. So as soon as he gets the ball, effectively your job is done as a defensive midfielder because he's always going to look to play 
a forward pass or cut in and try and play another forward pass. Um, it was very rare that Thomas would do everything and then just lay the ball off, uh, you know, for you to do something. But unless you're on the edge of the box, and I and I, I go back to my own experience, and I had a I think I scored a goal in the the semi final, uh, the second year against the against the Mariners, and it was a, a typical Thomas move. He's 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 jinking and dummy in the box, and he cuts out, and he probably could have shot and scored himself. He saw me charging forward and just laid a perfect 10, 10 metre pass for me to, to, to hit in the bottom corner. And um, it was just, again, the awareness that he, anything was going to happen once he got the ball in that box. You, you, you're almost assured of a, a goal-scoring opportunity because he was making the, the right decision in the final third most of the time. Uh, this might be another difficult question to answer. Uh, was it tough to leave at the end of those three years? Was it, because you were such a tight group. Um, but yeah. obviously you moved into to China, like, you know, you, you had, you know, you started your Asian odyssey, if you like. Yeah. Um, was, was it a wrench to leave? No, uh, it was difficult. I think a lot of people don't know. Uh, halfway through the second year, I was in the Socceroos camp um, and I had a call uh, to, to go to China. And they were offering the club over a million dollars transfer fee. The salary was ridiculous. Um, and at the time, I wasn't ready to leave. And, and Ange sort of spoke to me and I spoke to the club and they were like, look, it's a lot of money. Do you want to go? And I was just like, I'm not ready to leave yet, no. And uh, the next, you know, obviously turning that down, being in the Socceroos camp, and I think Roston Griffiths ended up going for that, that, that contract and it's still the highest uh, transfer fee for an Australian player overseas. I think it was $1.2, $1.4 million. So it would have made the club a lot of money. In hindsight, uh, having the career I've had now, um, maybe going for that contract would have made me better off financially. Um, but at that point in my career, I was more con concerned with what we were building, what we were, uh, you know, trying to win trophies and, and go on this 36-game beaten, unbeaten run. And um, it wasn't my time. Um, but as soon as Ange had left after the second year, um, it was a bit of blow, a bit of a blow for a lot of the players, to be honest. Um, we didn't see it coming, uh, and at that point in time, it was just kind of like, well, he's treating football as a business. Um, he used us in a sense, and we're going to have to use him as a sense. You know, that's just the way football works. And after we sort of, you know, we had a few hiccups the the, the start of the next season um, after beating Ange five nil at home, which was very very, very nice because I think the boys, the boys were motivated to prove a point like you should have stayed here. But we never begrudged him because he all gave us a lifeline that has given us all careers in the game. I, I guarantee you that if Ange wouldn't have brought us, all of us back to Brisbane at that time, that we probably wouldn't have been playing at any sort of level now or have, have had the success we've had. So I take my hat off to him from that. So from that point of view, um, I wasn't ready. And then... I had an offer to go to China in the next window, uh, you know, two and a half years into my, my three-year deal. And, you know, the club tried very, very hard to, to keep me. They offered me a very, very long-term deal, um, almost to basically finish my career. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't sign it because um, I felt as though uh, the money I turned down before, I need to try and, and make some money for myself. I'm not earning a lot of money here playing in Australia. And I went for a lot, lot less in China, to be honest. I still earned good money, but people think that, uh, you know, it was good money, but I could have earned more if I left early. I put it that way. And the same thing, you know, you go there and you sign a three-year deal, play every game, and in, in, in after one season, they want to get rid of you. So uh, Asia's very cutthroat, um, but I don't regret anything I've done in my career. It's cutthroat, and yet you've managed to really carve out a bit of a niche in India with Bengaluru. Um, I saw an interview where you said that the place itself grabs mm -hmm. a bit of a hold of you, and then that you know you yeah. can't, you can't, you feel like you can't leave it. Like I feel like there's that's a typical. Not I, I, you can either love or hate India. I think from what I've spoken to people who've spent time there, and it feels yeah. like you. Or it sounds like you've really, it's really got into you. Um, Bengaluru yeah. like um, you obviously signed a new contract there do you see that being the place that you end your career or 
I, I, I certainly see it, uh, you know, it'll take me to, to 36, um, which is a good number for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, I think uh, I, I'd love to try and play as long as possible. I don't think, uh, I don't think Aussie footballers are treated, it's going to sound bad, with a lot of respect once they hit 35. I think in the A-League, a lot of boys, are, you know, especially outfield players, um, you know, they'll, they'll want to get a younger player in for, for a guy who's 35, 36, 37. Um, it's been done before. I just feel with Asia and the roots that I've uh, I've built in India, it's going to be an easier uh, pathway for me. And I've had some tough times, you know. Uh, I won't delge into too much of, you know, South Korea and, and places like Qatar where I was treated pretty, pretty poorly for, for, you know, six to 12 months of my contracts. And uh, I had to go through quite a lot of... Uh, you know, mental strength to get through those points. And that's what brought me to India was, you know, going through those hard times where I was not being treated very well, lost the love for the game, lost, lost of love for, for life. And uh, India sort of revitalized that and just really, uh, like you said, took a hold of me. Um, it's a very difficult place. It's not for everybody, but uh, the football club and the environment, um, it was very similar to, to Brisbane where this team is, hungry for success. It's got all the right players in the right areas that, that want to do well. Um, and the day-to-day -day for me is brilliant. The, the coaching staff, you know, they're all Spanish. Um, their way of wanting to play the game um, is very, very similar to the way I like to play the game. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm important there. So I'm enjoying my time. You can never say never, but, uh, you know, after 36, your, your options become pretty limited. <laughs> is coaching something you'd ever consider uh, staying in India yeah. and coaching and helping keep that right wave going of support over there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've already started to sort of plan ahead now with, you know, doing a few courses online and, and thinking about getting my badges done soon. Um, you know, my, my idea is to, is to play and, and to coach over there when I'm finished. Um, there's been light, light discussions around that, um, you know, with the, you know, the, the, the landscape at the moment, nobody knows what's going to happen in any football sense. Um, we're just lucky to have a job and to get paid at the moment. So I've always found with, uh, with being a football player, um, and I'll use Matty Smith as an example, he, he's got all the makings of being a great coach um, and he's done all the right things, all the right pathway. But there comes a time where, um, like he's found now, to be um, a footballer or be a coach, I don't think you can be a footballer and thinking about being a coach because you take your mind off being a footballer. And that's just the way that I, I feel and think. And people will say, Oh, you've got a plan for your future. You can't be doing that. But if I don't put a hundred percent effort into any, to, to anything I do, then I, I, I get pretty bored pretty easily if I don't want it enough. Um, it's not to say I'm not planning, but I see these next two years as an opportunity to earn another contract, another year, another two years, another, whatever it is. Um, to keep playing and then I hope the opportunity to, to, to coach over there will be, will be present when I finish playing whenever that is um, you know coaching in Asia is very valuable um, I think they've got a great setup in, in, in Bangalore it might bring me to somewhere else in Asia or Australia or Europe I don't know um, I just feel with the experience I've had in football um, it would be a shame to sort of waste it and throw it away and just move into something else. It's, it's very tiring. I must say being in football, everyone thinks it's a, a cushy job and you train for two hours and you go home. Um, but, you know, you, 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 you sacrifice so much family time, relationships, um, you know, things, things aren't as easy as they seem, but it's just the, the love of the game that keeps coming, me, uh, you know, pulling me back. So hopefully in India, you, you never know. And hopefully in the meantime, you'll be able to pick up another couple of championships as well while you, while you are still yeah. lacing up the boots. That, that's, that's part of it too, too Simon, is that uh, you know, we're hungry to win this year because of the way we finished last year. It was a little bit disappointing for us as a club. Um, I had off offers to go elsewhere, other countries uh, and other clubs in, in India. I had a really good season last year. Um, but... The, the, the hunger and the desire of the club to try and get back to winning something was, was pretty important for me. And, you know, just to see how they adjusted after losing. Um, and I just, I just knew pretty quickly that, you know, we, we, I have to jump on board because I want to win a couple more trophies before I finish. Excellent. Well, 
best of luck with that, Eric. It has been an absolute delight to chat with you. It really has to get your insight Thanks, uh, and to be able to chat about Indian football because it's an area that is so fascinating yeah. for so many people. Um, and yeah. look, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Um, thanks so much for your time this time. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks, Simon. All the best, mate. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for joining us, everybody. Um, next time, you'll be able to join us once again when we wind the clock back on a famous icon from the Brisbane Royals history. So thanks very much for listening. We'll catch you next time.